Given the size of this assemblage tonight, it appears to me it must be what it was at one time at one of John Kennedy's uh, speaking engagements. And one thing about the book, it's cheap, and that is one of the reasons why its sales uh, did better than expected. Uh, I hope that you have a copy of the bibliography that was passed out. I came here with 75 copies thinking that that should cover the number of people who would be here. But when I came here earlier this morning, somebody told me, we love our presidents in Kansas City, and boy, do you. Uh, let me just say something about the bibliography. It contains, I think, the most well-known and uh, the best-reviewed books done on Kennedy and his presidency. And I've divided the bibliography into three parts. The Camelot School represents books that were done early usually early in his presidency, generally by insiders. Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., you, rep you recognize his name, surely, Ted Sorensen, and several others who participated in the Kennedy administration. But there were additional books that followed right up to uh, this year. I would have to put Chris Matthews's book in this same category. They take a very positive view of Kennedy. They perceive him to be a great president, and uh, uh, there's rarely a negative assessment in the course of the book. So inevitably, the backlash would follow. And these are the revisionists. Many of them journalists in the 1970s who wrote much more critically of Kennedy, who saw Kennedy uh, as one who created crises in foreign policy that need not have existed, and they considered that Kennedy failed in terms of his domestic policy. The third group are the post-revisionists. These are the books that generally have been done most recently. They take a measured view of Kennedy's presidency, balancing accomplishments with uh, failures on occasion. But all of them are grounded in the primary sources of material that exists in the Kennedy Library. So these books have been done more recently. You know, we are always fascinated with John Kennedy. That fascination exists today, as witnessed two books that have been recently published in the last five or six months, both of which on the bestseller list. One, of course, is Chris Matthews' book. If you've ever watched Hardball, you would see Matthews relentlessly promoting his book. Some would suggest shamelessly, but it did make the bestseller list. The other book is quite different. It's about an intern by the name of Mimi Alford, who served as a 19-year-old in the Kennedy White House and she had a sexual relationship with Kennedy that lasted 18 months. She lost her virginity as a consequence of that. And because she was outed a few years ago, she decided to write a book about that relationship. How many of you, by the way, have read Chris Matthews' book? Okay, a few hands. What about Mimi Alford? Okay, I expected more than that, but maybe, you know, we have a discerning group here. <laughs> what I would like to speak about is my odyssey, my personal odyssey with John Kennedy.
It lasted 30 years. I don't think anyone has spent that much time on John Kennedy as a writer as I have done. I thought it ended with my first book on Kennedy that was published in December of 1991. I thought I could go on to other things. But like Michael Corleone in Godfather 3, I kept being pulled back in. And I was asked to do other things related to Kennedy. I did three other books. I turned down a number of books along the way. I published a number of articles. I reviewed a ton of books and book manuscripts, and even film. I can remember one day before the premiere of Oliver Stone's JFK sitting in a theater in Springfield, Missouri, alone, watching the film so I could write a review for the local newspaper the next day. But it's not that I have just focused on Kennedy. I did a biography of Stan Musial that came out in 2001, and most recently, a biography of Tom Eagleton that came out this year. I won't ask if any of you have read it. I don't want to be embarrassed. <laughs> Let me now go back to how this odyssey got started. I came to Southwest Missouri State College, as it was called, in 1968. We came from Ohio. I was a graduate of Ohio State University. And my interest was how Ohio Republican politics intersected with national politics in the early 20th century. And the, the book that came from that was a biography of H.M. Doherty, Harding's corrupt attorney general. I don't know if any of you have watched Boardwalk Empire. The character Doherty comes out in two separate episodes in that series. But living in Missouri now, I thought I better become involved in researching my new state. And I began, began to take graduate students to the Truman Library to have them research in the Truman Papers. And I got interested in Truman myself. And I began to research and write articles about Truman. But ultimately, I found out that Harry Truman loved political cartoons. He collected them, the original drawings. And uh, political cartoonists found out that he loved these political cartoons. And they would send him the original drawings with an inscription, something humorous at the bottom of the cartoon. Some 1,200 of these exist in the Truman Library. Today, even, maybe even more. And with a former graduate student who was a, a skilled photographer, we reproduced these drawings, not only from the Truman Library, but from the Library of Congress, the State Historical Society, and from private collections. And we told Truman's public life using these political cartoons. And the book was titled Truman in Cartoon in Caricature, which came out in 1983. It was at that time that I befriended Donald McCoy. Donald McCoy was the chief editor of the American Presidency series published by the University Press of Kansas. And even at that time, that series had a reputation that was growing. And McCoy asked me if I would write the volume on Kennedy. I was honored, but it was also daunting to me because I knew that I would have to spend a lot of time in the Kennedy Library. And using public transfer, transportation to get there, it can be inaccessible. 
At least I thought that at the time. And I wondered, too, so many other books were done on Kennedy at this time, including Herbert Parmet's two volumes, which is in the bibliography. And I wondered, what could I do that others haven't already done? A good book has to advance the state of scholarship, either in terms of interpretation or in terms of new information. So what I did was to make a list of things that were not covered or not covered well in these other books. And they would include, for example, Kennedy's War on Crime, which at that time I thought was associated with the Kennedy assassination. The space program, agricultural policy, a boring topic, but an important one. Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. didn't even mention it once in his book. A long list of things. Kennedy's private life in the White House, for example. His relationship to the press. So I, I knew I had things that I could write about. And I knew that things were opening up at the Kennedy Library as materials on foreign policy were being declassified on Vietnam, on the Berlin crisis, on the missile crisis, for example. And there were a number of oral histories that were opening as well. Uh, these were transcripts. And I uh, succeeded in getting some of them open. But the most important thing I thought that I was able to do was through the Freedom of Information Act, I got the library to open the White House gate logs. And the gate logs contained the names of individuals who visited Kennedy at the White House, including the private quarters. And what I was able to confirm was that the amphetamines doctor, Max Jacobson, visited Kennedy something like 32 times through May of 1962. So I knew that, you know, that was not a rumor anymore. And women appeared too. <laughs> Judith Campbell. Campbell uh, visited Kennedy innumerable times. This confirmed what she had written in the mid-1970s in her own book. Mary Meyer was another one. Gloria Steinem. Steinem insisted, though, she was there to see Ted Sorensen, not Kennedy. That may be true. Uh, I'll give her the benefit on that. But sometimes it was David Power, who was a close friend of Kennedy, plus one female, and the time would be about 7.30 in the evening. There were other things in the gate log uh, records that proved very useful to me. What I also decided I had to do, which other writers did not do, was to provide a methodology. A methodology that would remove as much as possible my own personal bias regarding Kennedy. And there's two ways of doing that. One is to look at that person in terms of what he talked about in the campaign. What were his objectives, his goals, in the inaugural address, in the State of the Union addresses, in assess the extent to which he was able to accomplish what he set out to do. That is a bit unfair toward Kennedy because he did not serve a full term. And I felt that I could not just rely on that particular approach. But there's another approach. You can look at the person at the time that he comes into the White House. What were the crises and the problems that existed at that time? And then turn to the point where he left. What problems still exist? What did he rectify and make a judgment? Was the country better off for that person being president? 
With John Kennedy, his major concern was always foreign policy. He once said that foreign policy can kill you. You have to put that in the context of the Cold War. Domestic policy will destroy you, and he meant that politically. But foreign policy to him was more important, and that was reflected in the uh, polls, the Gallup polls for 1961-1962. The major concern on the part of the American people at that time was war and peace. Domestic issues were not that important. Civil rights was right at the very bottom. So that had to be taken into consideration as well. His inaugural address was almost exclusively on foreign policy. There were only two words that were devoted to domestic policy when he said that we have to promote human rights at home as well as abroad. That was it. And African Americans, though, focused on that. They focused on some of the other things that he said during the campaign, and they were inspired by it. James Meredith decided at that point that he was going to enroll at Ole Miss as a consequence of what he thought was a Kennedy commitment. What the inaugural address also said, and this was the basic strategy of the Kennedy presidency, that you arm to parley. That is, you build up your forces, your conventional forces, your nuclear forces, to put yourself in a position to negotiate with the Soviet Union. And he stood up to Khrushchev regarding West Berlin. And it was as a consequence of the buildup that took place prior to that particular point. Well, what crises did Kennedy face when he took office on January 21st of 1961? We were told by the Soviet Union at that time and it began in the Eisenhower administration, that we had to get out of West Berlin. We were given an ultimatum regarding that. This could have put us in a position of war. There was also at that time a civil war in Laos between the communists and the non-communists. There was a civil war in the Congo at that point too, which the Soviet Union hoped to exploit. Of course, there was Cuba. Fidel Castro, of course, was in control of Cuba. Kennedy initially exacerbated the problem with the Bay of Pigs, but that had to be dealt with as well. And uh, finally, uh, the Third World. We had to deal with that because the Soviet Union was beginning to make some inroads in that area. We were not as aware and attuned to the rise of nationalism uh, that existed, particularly in Africa, uh, during this period. If you look at 1960, 18 new countries emerged in Africa at that particular time. And we had to try to win over these countries. Well, what was the situation when Kennedy left office? Berlin was no longer a major problem. There was a neutralization of Laos, which was working fairly well. Working through the United Nations, the civil war in the Congo no longer existed, and in Cuba, following the missile crisis, the situation settled down there as well and it appeared like there would be a merging detente with the Soviet Union. I'll spend more time on the Cuban Missile Crisis as we go.
The only crisis that was really virulent at, at this time was Vietnam, and that was beginning to heat up in 1963. So my assessment of Kennedy was that he, better, he did a better job in terms of foreign policy, that the country was better off for his presidency as a consequence of his service uh, during those years. Now, what about the domestic situation? Kennedy inherited a recession from Eisenhower. The uh, growth rate was 2.5% in early 1961. The unemployment rate was 7%. That looks pretty good today, not so good back then. And there was a balance of uh, payments problems. We had other economic issues as well. And uh, agricultural policy was a disaster because of the overproduction of American farmers. Poverty existed in America. That had to be addressed. There was a long list of problems uh, that, that remained. Kennedy did not do so well domestically. True, the economy improved. The growth rate in 1963 was 5%. The tax cut bill that would be legislated finally in the Johnson administration would shoot it up to 6%. The unemployment was down. There was a job training program. The first public housing program for urban America was legislated since the Truman administration of 1949. But racism still prevailed. Not a whole lot was done regarding civil rights, although, Trum although Kennedy would suggest that civil rights was a moral imperative. And there was a major civil rights bill that was in Congress in 1963 that I am convinced if Kennedy had lived in modified form, it would have been legislated. But no Medicare, which Kennedy wanted, no public aid to education, which Kennedy wanted, Part of it was his failing. He was not a good legislative leader. He didn't take enough interest in it. But the partisanship that existed in this period was not quite as bad as it is today, but it was not good. Uh, so domestically, the situation was a bit improved, but not quite uh, at the same plane as uh, the foreign policy situation. But I've always believed that you have to adopt a holistic view of Kennedy. I think Bob Dalek believes in that too. There was something special about him, something inspiring. The way he spoke, the hope that he presented, uh, the wit, the Harvard accent, who knows? It was also youth. And the interesting thing about that is, we never had somebody that young for years. The world didn't. I mean, Khrushchev was in his 70s. Conrad Adnar in West Germany hit 80. De Gaulle was in his upper 70s. Macmillan in England, the prime minister, was old. And uh, Eisenhower was nearing 70, if not 70, when he left office. And even Truman was an old man, comparatively speaking. So you have this vibrant, younger leader who could inspire young people, and he certainly did in many ways. Through the Peace Corps, through the Alliance of Progress program, in government service and other ways, he projected the view that national politics any politics was an honorable profession. I uh, was reminded of that in 1992 when I delivered a convocation address at Drury University and they wanted me to talk about Kennedy. 
And what I did at that time was to contact people in our state government, in the executive branch and in the legislative branch. I asked them a couple of questions in writing. Who inspired you to become involved? The vast majority of them said John Kennedy. Some, if you were Republican, would say Ronald Reagan. That's understandable. I remember Mel Carnahan, who was Lieutenant Governor at the time, he said Harry Truman. You might remember Jerry Litton. A couple said Jerry Litton. But the majority of them said John Kennedy, otherwise they would have never gotten involved. Well, in any case, my book, I hoped at the time, and I think it turned out to be, that was a balanced approach in which I tried to balance attainments and limitations. It got good reviews. I evaluated Kennedy as above average. Some historians have thought him as average, but generally when you look at the various historical polls, they're between average and above average. If it is above average, he is the only president in our history who served less than a full term, who has had that evaluation. But what is so striking here is the tremendous divergence between the general public regarding Kennedy and the scholars, the so-called scholars, the historians and the political scientists, that the general public even today thinks that John Kennedy is a great president. It's been documented in various polls, but it's a different view uh, among historians. You know, I did other things after this book came out, as I've mentioned, regarding Kennedy, including a book-length bibliography that contained everything ever written on Kennedy in all the primary sources nationwide, especially in the Kennedy Library. I continued my interest, but nothing really fundamentally changed until the turn of the new century. And by that time, the Cold War was over. And the uh, director of the University Press of Kansas asked me to come out with an updated, revised edition of the Kennedy book. Bring it up to date, make it current. And uh, I wondered at that point how I would be affected by the fact that the Cold War had ended. Would I see Kennedy any differently? And I clearly saw the obsession that presidents back then rightly had about the Cold War. It affected their policy in a number of ways. And, uh, you know, when you talk about the new frontier, which represented Kennedy, that is different from Roosevelt's New Deal because the New Deal focused exclusively on domestic matters. The New Frontier showed an interrelationship between domestic and foreign policy, which one could call national policy, because the Cold War commanded everything. What examples could I give you? Take civil rights. Kennedy sincerely believed that civil rights was a moral imperative. But at the same time, he understood that if we continued the discrimination, the segregation in this country, we could not hope to win the support of third world countries. They would view us negatively. And it would be the Soviet Union that would capitalize on that. So for foreign policy considerations, we had to deal with civil rights here as well. Another example would be agricultural policy. 
we had overproduced tremendously because of the lack of sufficient controls in the Eisenhower administration. Farm prices dropped. Our warehouses uh, were full of surpluses. Would it not help through a Food for Peace program to provide surpluses to third world countries, which we did. We benefited from it. They benefited from it. We even negotiated a wheat deal with the Soviet Union in 1963. Uh, one could do the same thing with the space program and uh, with the Peace Corps as well, that there is this interrelationship between domestic and foreign policy. What motivated me further to return to Kennedy fully were the new sources that were opening up by this time. Uh, many books, very specialized books on the Kennedy presidency had been written. They had to be read and assimilated and included in any revised study. But more than that, new sources opened up at the Kennedy Library. Nothing more important than the White House medical records of John Kennedy. Medical records that not only covered his presidency, but went back through the 1950s as well. And I have Robert Dalek to thank for that. Dalek is a fine historian. And it was Dalek who got the donor committee at the library to open the medical records with the provision that your entry had to be approved by the committee and you had to bring a physician with you. This was 2002, four months after Dalek, I and Dr. Burt Park uh, received permission. Dr. Park, obviously a neurosurgeon, was my physician, and he's with us tonight with his wife, Vicki. Burt, would you stand up, please? Uh, like Dalek, we spent two days at the Kennedy Library going through that material. But the records were so voluminous that I went back and spent an entire week. And then I got the Kennedy Library to open all of the correspondence from Kennedy's father, who communicated with the Mayo Clinic and the Lay Clinic at the time when Kennedy was very young through the 1930s in the 1940s. So for the first time, that material could be used as well. And uh, well, what did we learn as a result of all of this? We learned that Kennedy definitely had Addison's disease, and a lot of specifics were there about that. As you may know, Addison's disease is a malfunctioning of the adrenal glands. And if you're not properly medicated, you have no hope of living. The key medication by 1950 was cortisone, which could be taken orally. And that medication would be more perfected in the years to come. But you had to be very careful regardless. Any trauma, any stress, anything that disrupted the body in any way could create an Addisonian crisis, and you could die. So this was something that Americans did not know anything about at that time. Dalek claimed in his book that Kennedy contracted Addison's disease because he was treated with steroids for colitis in the 1930s. We determined that he did not have colitis, 
The records for that period showed he was never treated with steroids in the 1930s. And we also found out through contacts with endocrinologists that you can't contract Addison's disease with steroids. So that was one mistake that Dalek did make in his book. Regarding his gastrointestinal problems, it was determined by the physicians at the time, at the Mayo and the Lay Clinic, experts in that area, and subsequently by physicians in the White House, that there was nothing wrong with Kennedy organically. He never had colitis. What it was was stress. That was the primary cause. People who were under stress are affected differently. Sometimes it can hit the gut. That ran in the Kennedy family. And so he had to be treated uh, a bit differently. Today we would classify this as irritable bowel syndrome, which is a, a diagnosis of exclusion. If they can't find anything medically wrong with you, you have irritable bowel. Uh, one other thing uh, was dealt with in the medical records, and that had to do with Kennedy's back problems, which remained with him for his entire life. You know, it's been erroneously suggested that football at Harvard created the problem. What I think, based on talking with a number of physicians, happened is that he was born with one side of his body slightly shorter than the other, would impose pressure on the sacroiliac joint on the left side. This could have been treated with persistent physical therapy, which Kennedy never made a commitment to. As it turns out, he had back surgery back surgery that should have never been done in 1944, and it was a botched job. It made his back problems worse as a consequence, causing back surgery in 1954, which he almost died from because of his Addison's disease, and surgery again in 1955. Dalek in his book claimed that Kennedy suffered from osteoporosis. That caused his back problems. Osteoporosis is a degeneration of bone mass and bone density in the back. Bert Park looked at the x-rays at the Kennedy Library and found no osteoporosis in Kennedy. The uh, doctors at the time suggested that Kennedy did not have osteoporosis. And the Kennedy Library brought, brought in a consultant to study the x-rays, and he drew the same conclusion as well. So even a fine historian can make some uh, assumptions that turned out to be uh, incorrect. But Dowling got it right in pointing out that Kennedy was on a minimum of seven medications twice a day. And medications not only for his Addison's disease, he also suffered from hypothyroidism. He also had high cholesterol, which was 358 at its highest level. And uh, he had all sorts of problems with allergies as well. So this required medication. Kennedy often self-medicated, which was not good. And his reliance on an amphetamines doctor certainly was not good because it competed with the medications that the other physicians were to provide. And uh, he was also, maybe rightly so, self-absorbed about his health problems. He did suffer from chronic prostatitis. Chronic prostatitis was an inflammation of the prostate gland in the urinal tract, which was sexually transmitted early uh, as a young man. 
And uh, so he had other problems as well, particularly in allergies. The final thing I'll talk about, because I know we're running out of time here, I need to focus a bit on the Cuban Missile Crisis. That was the major crisis of his presidency. And, and by this time, 2000, 2002, things had opened up at the Kennedy Library. All of the XCOM meetings, meetings of the Executive Committee of the National Security Council, were available for research. Transcriptions were available. When I did the book in 1991, I only had access to two days of meetings. But all these meetings now were available. Very important, too, things opened up in the Soviet Union, in Russia. Two scholars, one an American and one a Russian, got into Khrushchev's papers, in the papers of the Presidium, so you could get the Russian point of view. And this was published in a very excellent book, One Hell of a Gamble. And, uh, well, what did we learn from all of this? Well, no missile gap, we already knew this, but this was reaffirmed, existed to our disadvantage. We had overwhelming superiority to the Soviet Union with ICBMs, 172 to something less than 20. And the Soviet missiles were not very accurate. In terms of nuclear warheads, we had an advantage of a ratio of 17 to 1 uh, over the Soviet Union. What we also learned, too, while Kennedy was a wonderful crisis manager, and he did that well in terms of the desegregation of Ole Miss, Alabama, and the Freedom Rides in 1961, for example, as he would do in the missile crisis. He was on target in terms of good judgment on that, but he was not always a good crisis avoider. And the fact is that the Cuban Missile Crisis could have been avoided. It was not avoided because of the errors of both countries. All started with the Bay of Pigs. Indirectly, we were involved in the invasion of Cuba in April of 1961. Right after the Bay of Pigs, the administration adopted Operation Mongoose. Mongoose, headed by the CIA, was an attempt to cause sabotage activities in Cuba. And there were attempts to assassinate Fidel Castro as well. The Soviet Union was convinced that the United States intended to invade Cuba. So why were the missiles put in? Why would Castro even accept Soviet missiles? It was the concern of that possible invasion. Those missiles were to act as a deterrent uh, to that. It's not the only Khrushchev motivation. This disparity in missiles could be somewhat alleviated by putting intermediate and medium range missiles in Cuba to give him ICBMs on the cheap. But the primary consideration was this concern uh, about possible American invasion. The fact is, both sides relied astonishingly on poor intelligence. For example, we did not know at the time that there were some 40,000 Soviet troops and technicians in Cuba. Our estimate was way low uh, against that. Secondly, we thought that Khrushchev was being pushed by the Presidium. He called all the shots in the Soviet Union uh, regarding the missile crisis, for which he would have to later pay politically, by the way. Uh, we could not understand Soviet motivation for putting these missiles in Cuba. Many years later, Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, was to say at one of these meetings with Russians, 
that if we had known that you were concerned about this invasion, we could understand your feelings and why you did what you did. But why did we not understand this at that particular time? As far as the Soviets were concerned, the assumption that we were going to attack was misguided, I think, despite the signals that came to the contrary. But more than that, I don't understand how the Soviet Union could have ever thought that they could put these missiles in Cuba without discovery. And to think that the United States would not do anything about it once they were in place. As it turned out, and we just have a couple of more minutes here, the missile crisis itself was a greater threat than imagined at that time and even in 1991 when I did the book because we did not know at that time that the Soviet commander in Cuba had discretion, discretionary authority to use tactical uh, nuclear weapons against our invasion. This is what the Hawks in the Kennedy administration wanted to do in the midst of the missile crisis. Knock out the missiles by air, which would have killed a number of Russians, and secondly, invade Cuba. If we would have done that, this have, could, could have precipitated a major war. It was not until October 26 that Khrushchev had ordered the Soviet commander that under no circumstances should those missiles be used. Another aspect of faulty intelligence, Khrushchev did not understand, even when we cut a deal with the Soviet Union, that we would promise not to invade Cuba if the missiles were taken out, that we would also remove our missiles from Turkey the Jupiter missiles there. This was a secret arrangement, the latter part of the agreement. Before that particular arrangement, Khrushchev, so convinced that we were going to attack, decided not to uh, keep the missiles in. Kennedy's performance certainly overshadowed the Bay of Pigs fiasco of 1961. And he rightly comes out as a stronger president politically and in every which way as a consequence of the missile crisis. That cannot be forgotten. He was elevated in the public opinion polls at this point, and what loomed ahead was a possible detente with the Soviet Union. Things looked better in terms of our relationship, but this should not detract from the fact that this crisis could have been avoided. And this is something that Chris Matthews and others have not stated in their own work. And I think at this particular point, I was told I had 50 minutes. I probably exceeded that by a few, and I better stop at this point. So that's it.